welcome back to the garage for episode number two and today I'm talking all about the double wishbone suspension. So you can see I'm running push rod suspension. I'm going to disconnect that for this video and probably keep that whole system as a separate episode in the future. I've removed the push rod now and I've put a jack under it to bring it up to normal ride height and later on in the video I'm going to use the jack to show you how the camber changes and how you could potentially adjust your roll center. To begin the design process you need to know what size tire you're going to be running and what size wheel. So in my case because I'm building the car to World Time Attack Pro-Am rules. Uh, they run a 295 tire, well they did at the time anyway, and so that's what I'm using. And that gives you the overall diameter of your tire, which is gonna determine how high your upright sits off the ground. So taking that information, I built another welding jig to hold the upright at the height it would be in that wheel, because I actually didn't have that wheel when I first started building the suspension. To go from a McPherson strut to a double wishbone, the first thing you're gonna need is a new upright. There's pretty limited choices over here in Australia. The two I came up with was the Honda S2000 and the Mazda RX-8. The Honda S2000 is actually a pretty rare and expensive car in Australia. So I ruled that one out pretty much straight away. And then the Mazda RX-8, there's actually a lot of those in Australia and a lot of them have broken engines. So the parts are pretty easy and cheap to buy. The next part of the design process is to choose where you're going to put your pivot points. So the two pivot points in your upright are pretty much fixed in position, but you do get to choose the inboard points. So you've got your upper pivot and your lower pivot down here. The position of those pivots combined with the actual length of the arms, both upper and lower, will determine how your suspension behaves. The length of the arms is going to have some restrictions placed on it based on how wide you want your track width to be and also how wide the engine bay is. So in the BRZ, because the car came originally with a flat four engine, it's actually a really wide engine bay, which in turn means that you don't have a lot of space to put your, your upper control arms because it's so far out and so wide, you don't have a lot of space. So what I did is I looked at the Mazda RX-8 suspension geometry and I used that as a rough guide but of course I wasn't able to do exactly the same as that because of the width of the engine bay in the BRZ so I had to make my own decisions about how wide the arms would be and also I had a lot of limitation to with the width of my trailer that I'm going to be using to get this car to and from the races so the trailer is only so wide and if I just make the track width as wide as I want I wouldn't be able to get the car onto the trailer. Just to quickly show you how wide the trailer is I've got the WRX on there at the moment, but we can measure the width. So, measuring the width. We got 1880 roughly. Maximum width from the outside edges of both tyres on the BRZ is all I can put on this trailer. The length of the control arms also has some effect on the turning circle. Being a race car, I wasn't too worried about that because I'm not going to be trying to reverse park it at the shopping centre, but it was something I had to consider with such a wide tyre. And then the other part of the steering that was important was the actual, the fact now that the steering rack is in front, or it's what they call front steer instead of rear steer, like the original design. And I had to make sure that the steering rack was actually going to clear the engine. The engine can only go so far back under the rule, but I still had to be able to get the steering rack to fit in front of the engine without fouling on the crank pulley or anything like that. It's actually pretty close to the crank pulley. What I ended up doing was I had to move the wheelbase 35 millimeters forward to clear the front of the engine. Otherwise I would have had a problem with the steering rack hitting the engine. So that's what I've, that's what I've done. I've extended the wheelbase by 35 millimeters forwards. I used software to design the suspension. It was actually a really old program called Wishbone and I actually haven't been able to get it to work ever since upgrading my PC but I still have all the numbers written down and the way it worked was you put all your pivot points in X, Y and Z and the length of your arms and then you could put the suspension in roll or bump and see what effect that would have on the camber or the roll center and you just kept playing around with those positions until the suspension was doing something that wasn't really like everything's a compromise so you might get it perfect in camber gain but then the roll center was shooting through the floor or well, then you got your roll center perfect 
but the camber was going positive in roll. So after playing around with the software for a while, I realized that everything is a compromise and you just have to come up with a setting that is pretty good at everything, but you know, not perfect in one area. Just a quick look at the suspension software. So you've got all your pivot point positions, X, Y, Z, and then down here it just tells you if you say, I want to see what happens with three degrees of body roll, it will tell you what happens to the camber and the roll center and things like that. And you'll notice that I've actually got a lot of adjustability built into the suspension. So you can see the inner pivot there. I can actually move that up and down. It's the same with the lower pivot. And it's actually the same with the steering rack. I can actually move the steering rack up and down. So the reason for that is, is twofold. One, it means I can change my ride height and keep my geometry how I want it. The steering rack, of course, moving that up and down lets you fine tune the bump steer. But the other main, I think the main reason was, you know, this was the first time I designed suspension from scratch. And I wasn't 100% confident that what I designed was going to be right. So giving that amount of adjustability meant that later on I would be able to, if I thought it wasn't doing what I wanted it to do, I could come back and I could move those pivot points up or down a little bit without having to rebuild everything. What I'm doing here is I'm going to demonstrate one of the benefits of the double wishbone suspension. I put the angle finder on the hub. You can see we've got a static camber of minus two at normal ride height. So imagine the car's going through a corner and this side of the suspension is going to get compressed. And let's see what happens to the camber when I jack up the wheel. So you can see the camber is going more and more negative as you go through the corner. So I've demonstrated that the camber goes more negative as you roll through a corner, which is going to give you a lot more grip in the corner because you're keeping your contact patch flatter on the surface of the road. Now, also another benefit with this suspension is if you're not happy with the rate that it's going negative, say it's not going negative enough through roll, you can actually easily adjust that. All you have to do is move this pivot point here down a little bit and it'll actually go more negative more quickly. You can also easily control the height of your roll centre by moving this inner pivot here up or down. So say you change the ride height and the roll centre is too low or, or it's too high, just by moving that pivot point you can easily adjust that setting. You can adjust the static camber by moving these rod ends in and out at the top, same at the bottom. These are parallel to each other, which means you can wind them in and out without that distance changing. Of course, that means the rod end is in bending, but these rod ends are oversized. The caster can be adjusted by moving the rod ends in or out. So on the upper arm, if you move this one in, that's gonna cause the top of the upright to come forward which would decrease caster, or you could move the rear one in or out, and that's gonna bring it back. And then it's the same at the bottom. You can even move the rear or the forward right end in or out, and that's gonna shift the base of the upright, either forward or back, adjusting the caster. The only other consideration besides camber and caster, roll center, is going to be the Ackerman. I haven't actually measured the Ackerman, but I know that it's got anti-Ackerman because the wheelbase of the BRZ is actually shorter than the wheelbase of a Mazda RX-8. If you draw a line through the tyre rod intersecting the ball joint towards the rear differential, those lines from each side would intersect behind the diff, giving it anti-Ackerman. I wanted to talk a bit about the fabrication process of making not only the upper and lower control arms but also the main subframe that runs underneath the engine and connects to both lower control arms. So you can see here I've got the welding jigs still. This big one here is for the main subframe, front subframe. The main subframe, as you can see here, 
not only supports the engine but it also connects to the lower control arms on both sides. And then we've got the two control arm welding jigs. So the smaller one at the front is for the upper control arms and the larger one is for the lower control arms. Because I've still got the welding jigs, I can always remake the lower and upper control arms. I consider these ones to be version one and in the future, I may take the opportunity to build new control arms that are not, not only more aesthetically pleasing to look at, but probably using more fancy lightweight material just to shave a bit of weight off the front end. To begin the fabrication process, it was all the boxes I did first. These are the boxes that hold the rod ends where the control arms mount to the chassis. Starting with the lower control arm boxes, these were mounted at the correct height, squared up to each other, and then using some chew, I joined those to the chassis using the original chassis mount position of the original front cross member. So this is the beginnings of the front cross member for the car. Once the lower arm boxes were in position, it was a matter of getting the upper control arm boxes ready to go into the car so I had to cut some slots in the frame rails and then position the boxes inside the chassis make sure everything was all squared up and then weld them into the chassis so once all four boxes on each side were in position it was then time to start making the upper control arms for those I used the jig that held the upright in position made sure everything was in the right spot and then started fabricating the upper control arms once the upper control arms were tacked into position with the rod end joining over to the spherical bearing. I would take those off the car, move to the bench and build the welding jig and then the welding jig was used to hold everything in the correct position while I welded the whole upper control arm together in a much more comfortable position. So once the upper control arms were both fabricated it was time to basically repeat that process on the lower control arms. With the lower control arms it was just a matter of using scrap metal to join from the rod end on the chassis side over to the spherical bearing which was mounted to the upright and that would lock it in position and then again I could take it off the car move to the bench build the welding jig and weld the whole thing together in a in a comfortable way mounting the steering rack was actually the last thing I did because I needed to have the engine in the correct position first because like I mentioned previously the steering rack was going to be very close to the front of the engine so the steering rack was the last thing I did so that brings me to the end of episode two I've tried to cover everything if I've missed anything or you have any questions, leave them in the comments and I'll try and get back to you. Thanks for watching.